Back in the 1950s, Ellen Bialystok told me, most North American parents, and a good many others around the world, were particularly anxious to protect their children from the perils of bilingualism. After all, learning one language well was hard enough, went the standard wisdom of the day, and it was important to focus on getting it right so as not to confuse one's child. But times have changed, and many aspects of conventional wisdom have disappeared along with them, not least influenced by Ellen's own findings. An internationally celebrated York University psychologist, Ellen has spent much of her influential research career carefully studying the effects of bilingualism. It turns out that not only are children more resilient to diverse streams of information than we once believed, but that a lifetime of living in a bilingual environment is actually very good for all of us, no matter what our age, yielding, through the wonders of neuroplasticity, a brain that is in many ways healthier and more robust than would naturally arise through exposure to only one language. So how did you actually get involved in the whole bilingualism thing? Was, so, was there a personal story there? Was it just uh, an opportunity psychologically in terms of your studies, or, or how did that start? It was a natural extension of the research I was doing. And in research, you don't really know where it's going to lead. One thing leads to another, and then you follow up the questions that are left over. I was studying language and cognitive development in children. That's how I did my graduate work. I was interested in how children learn language and how that connects up to their developing cognitive systems. And it, it evolved naturally. When I graduated, I ended up working on a project looking at second language learning in high school classrooms, something that there was very little research on at the time. This was the 70s. And kids were learning languages in high school. Nobody paid much attention to it. So you were lo looking at what, how, how quickly they were able to pick it up? Or, yeah, or? so it, this was in Ontario. So we were looking at kids learning French in school. So does, is there any point to it? Does it do anything? Do they learn French? Does anything actually happen? And so it was part of this large scale project that was very much from the perspective of education. Uh, it was housed in a faculty of education. The questions were very educational. How should we teach language? Right. What are effective strategies for teaching? What are effective strategies for learning? So it was very much at the level of pedagogy, something I knew nothing about, by the way. But I knew something about language, and I knew language development in children, so I was hired to manage a part of that project. And what did you find out, by the way, in that, in that project? What, were I there read any almost conclusions? nothing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was kind of a question that has no answers, you know? Yeah. The, these big pedagogical questions where you assume there's kind of a one-size-fits-all, I think. But not even micro-results, like, yeah. like if, if you do this particular thing on a regular basis, uh, there, there, there's a, a built-in control group, and this tends to work statistically better than than, than that. There's nothing. There was really right. nothing. nothing. Nothing of any right. interest, <laughs> <laughs> except that some kids were learning French and some kids weren't, yeah. and and that in itself is interesting, right? So, and and there was also at the time this interest, and including in the group that I was working with. To, f to discover what they were calling the good language learner, you know. So, right, some people, they speak, they claim 26 languages all fluently. Some people cannot learn to say bonjour. They cannot do that. It, their, their whole being rejects that. So, well, what's going on here? And there were a few studies trying to figure out what it is that enables some people to be good language learners and others not. And again, those studies didn't show much, but I, I now actually have an opinion on this. And I have a very holistic view of the mind and the brain and ability. And it's dead simple. Everybody is good at some stuff and bad at some stuff. And like everything, language is a kind of a talent. Some people are very good at physics or math or music, or dance, or sport, and some people are very good at language. So we all get some kind of ability profile, and if you link up ability with interest, and motivation, and opportunity, you'll learn language. I think it's 
pretty much that simple. Of course, we all learn language. I mean, all of us learn language. Uh, th there's, there's this question about whether, how much of it is innate and how much of it is learned, but there's clearly a large innate component to the, to the human condition of being able to learn language. Well, in some sense, everything we learn is innate because we are innately prepared to learn it. But I, I would put the question out, do we all learn our first language and perhaps our only language? If you just take a large group of monolinguals, does everybody learn the language in the same way, to the same level, with the same degree of proficiency? I don't think so. We're not all poets. So everything is distributed. Some people just love language, learn it easily, eat it for breakfast. And if you give them more languages, they'll eat more breakfast. And some people are, you know, end up being pretty rudimentary in their linguistic abilities. Right. So even there, there's a distribution, I think. But of course, we are wired to learn language. That doesn't mean the content of language is innate. It means the ability to learn this content. The predisposition to yeah. be able to do it. So getting back to your story, so you, did, you, you, were, you were doing these pedagogical uh, things, for lack of a better word. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a better things, word things out there. Things is a technical yeah. term. <laughs> okay. And you uh, perhaps recognized at the time, or maybe did not, that it was somewhat less than ideally efficacious. Uh, and from there, what happened to move over into? Right, so that what that did was introduce me to this world of, at that time, pretty nascent research in second language acquisition um, at all. And within that very small area of research, there was an even more nascent crumb that looked at it from the perspective of psychology. Well, now we're on to something because I was trained as a psychologist, and so I just gravitated to that. And there were a few people, a very small number of people, who I can name on one hand, who used the methods of psychology to look at these questions in more detail. And so I became one of those people. So I was kind of there when we started asking questions about this from the perspective of psychology. So the psychological questions are, well, what's the mind doing when you're learning another language? So what's happening to the language you already know? How do they live together? Um, do, does something else change? I mean, how can we, as adults particularly, take on a whole new way of speaking? These are psychological questions, right. not pedagogical questions. So there were a small number of us that started asking those questions. And then just to complete the story, how I ended up doing what I was doing, not only was I trained as a psychologist, I was trained as a developmental psychologist. So I ended up asking those questions from the perspective of children's development. And by children, we're looking mostly at younger children, at older children? At yeah, at first, mostly younger children. And so that set out the sort of first stage of my research. What happens to children's language and cognitive abilities when they either are learning or have been exposed to two languages in the home? Right. And, and you had written in one of the review papers, if memory serves, that up until fairly recently, the early 1960s, there was a sense that um, the that, that children who were bilingual, or at least who had, who had competency in two languages, um, had all sorts of negative developmental aspects associated with them. And it wasn't until the this, this study uh, in the 1960, whatever two, it is, 1962. Right, um, that, that, that some serious research started to uh, be done and, and things started to move forwards. Where did this, where did this notion come from? Where did this stereotype that, that people were somehow deve uh, developmentally handicapped by, by having two languages, where, where, where did that come from? I think it came from two places. One is people are afraid of language. And the second is racism. And the combination of these things was lethal. So here are some of the forces that you get. Um, I mean, I, I can add that even though the conclusion is, is pretty terrible, that you know languages are bad, protect your children from languages, these are the kinds of things <laughs> people would say, 
there was a little bit of research that fed right into it that had been done with the best of all intentions, except that it was badly done and it came out with the wrong results. So, so what are these sources? People are afraid of languages. People, especially in North America, much less so in Europe, sure. but Europeans are not immune to these attitudes. But certainly in North America, and particularly in the 50s, when all of this was really becoming popular belief, uh, people thought, language is very hard. I'm so glad my child is learning to speak English on schedule. I'm not going to mess with that and confuse them with another language because we know that when we look at kids who have to speak two languages, they just mix them all up and they don't know which language they're speaking. So it's too hard. I'm going to protect my child because everybody wants the best for their child. So I've got to protect my child from language. That is an, an, an honestly motivated, well-intentioned opinion that just happens to be wrong. Right, but it's not a scientific opinion. No. It's, it's an opinion by the, the person on the street who, again, is fearful of bad things happening or suboptimal things happening to his or her child. And it's based on anecdotal evidence. In fact, it's true that if you take three-year-old kids who are raised in homes where two languages are spoken, they will mix up the languages, but not because they're confused. It's actually quite brilliant what they're doing. What they really want to do is communicate. So they will use all the resources they have, and if they don't have a word they need in this language, they're just going to use what they know because they're motivated by communication. And an adult will say, oh, oh this is shocking. He used the French word, and he's supposed to be speaking English to me. Right. But it's actually not. So this leads us right into the study. So I want to get into that, and I want to get into what you found. So my sense is, until, let's just say, the study in 1962 by these people, was it Peel, Peel and, and Lambert, Lambert in Montreal? Or, okay. So until that, by and large, uh, I understand it, there wasn't very much in the way of rigorous empirical studies that were actually conducted. But from that point onwards, there started to be a basis of, of, of scholarship yeah. and studies that, that were done. And you've certainly contributed to that and, and moved that forward. So can you tell me a little bit about, about those studies and, and what sorts of things you've found, both in the, in the verbal and, uh, and in the nonverbal side? Right. So the, the trajectory is pretty simple. So I'll just lay it out as a timeline. The way we started was by looking at language ability. So bilingualism is a linguistic experience. If you're going to find any effect, you would think it's going to be in something to do with language. So the most important linguistic achievement that young kids make is to develop what's called metalinguistic awareness, knowledge about language, understanding what language is, that it can be manipulated. If you don't understand that language is a structured system, you can't learn to read because you can't figure out that the things on the page refer to something in language. So metalinguistic awareness is crucial. And in the first studies that started in the late 70s and continued for about a decade, um, a number of people, including my own group, were looking at the development of metalinguistic awareness and finding that, by and large, bilingual children are ahead. So they, you know, all of these little metalinguistic insights, the bilingual kids are catching sometimes about a year earlier. So they figure out that language is a thing. So how do you measure that? What, how do, how we have tasks, so you know, a couple of tasks. Here, here's a task that we've used to great satisfaction. It's a simple, silly task, but it's given us great insights. If you know, if you speak a language really well, and this every linguist will say, what a native speaker can do is intuitively tell you if a sentence is grammatical or not. Okay, so the orchids are on the table. You can say, yep, that's pretty much how you'd say it in English, okay? And um, you can do this even with very young children who are just learning English. So children as young as three years old can tell you if a sentence is grammatical or not grammatical. If you get kids to do this, they're all fine. So we put a little wrench in it and we say, all right, we want you to tell us if the sentence is said the right way, but just tell us if the sentence is said this the right way. Sometimes the sentence is going to be silly. That's okay. It's fun to be silly. We can say silly things. 
but you have to tell us if it's said the right way. So you give them all the permutations, and then you come to things like the orchid is on the nose. And say, the orchid is on the nose. Wow, that's ridiculous. <laughs> it's on the table. Say, no, just is it said the right way? So what you have to do is separate the grammatical structure from the meaning, and that is the essence of metalinguistic understanding. Right. So they, they have some appreciation of the structure of grammar without actually looking at just focusing on the semantic content, which is what... They is know that that's separate. Right. So bilingual kids can do that. We even have evidence now using neurological brain imaging showing that that's a judgment that even bilingual adults make better than monolingual adults. Now, they'll all get the right answer, of course, but you can see what's going on. The brain of right. a bilingual adult shows that, yeah, I can do that. I cannot get distracted by this silly meaning. Right. I, I want to get to the brain stuff in a, in a bit. Uh, but um, so, so the first studies you were doing were, were these, or were the first studies we've just been talking about, were these metalinguistics. Exactly. Studies. So we got that clear. So kids are figuring out something about language. It's not terribly surprising that using two languages means you're going to understand the structure of language better. Fine. So the next step then is to say, well, what else is going on? Is, is the rest of the mind involved in this? And here I have to say there's an assumption that people still hold about the brain. That's I recently read a list uh, in the New York Times about the, the 10 biggest myths about the brain that are wrong. And this, this um, assumption was on the list of one of the things people... So people think that the brain is divided up into little sections and that we only use some of them and that there's all this specialization. Well, that's not true. We use all our brain for everything. The brain is just one big blob that has specialized wiring within it. So everything affects everything. And moreover, there's plasticity issues that come into play, which we'll hopefully we'll talk about. And we're going to talk about that, because okay. that's the key. So just in terms of how it functions, um, what you're doing with language has to affect what you're doing with everything. So we were actually the first group that struck out and said, well, let's look at the rest of cognition. This was um, anticipated by the Peel and Lambert study that you can find differences in just ordinary cognitive measures that aren't linguistic. So we were then able to look at kids who were monolingual or bilingual and give them tests of cognitive ability to see if there was any difference. And the important thing we found is that if you just give kids tests that look like intelligence tests or knowledge tests or anything like that, kids are all exactly the same. Right. But if the task involves some kind of conflict where there's misleading information, like the meaning of the sentence, the orchid is on the nose, you have to just ignore the meaning so you can look at how the sentence is said. If you translate that to a nonverbal task where you have to ignore something that's pulling your attention, the bilingual kids were better. So what they were able to do is focus on what's important without being distracted when two things are competing. And we found this in nonverbal tasks. So that was the next step into how bilingualism was um, affecting the right. mind in more general terms. And so my understanding of what's going on is that when a bilingual individual, let's just say when a bilingual child, let's focus on children for the time being, when a bilingual child is engaging in the world, both in a verbal way and in a non uh, non-officiously verbal way, these two systems, these two languages are both at some level working simultaneously. So it's not as if, even if the child is operating in English and, and is English, French, bilingual, the French cognitive functions are still happening. And so there is this sense of the ability uh, of the child to be able to turn one off or dim one down and focus because there is this interference that's somehow going on. Is that a, is that a fair way to that look that at it? That is exactly right. And I'm going to, that's exactly right, and I'm going to make it a little more complicated by telling you about some very recent evidence 
uh, that people have reported, showing that you can find these effects, these uh, sort of advantages in paying attention to one thing and shutting out distraction in the first year of life. Right. So kids who are raised in homes where they're hearing two languages, these are babies. They're seven months old. They don't know a single word, but they are hearing two sources of linguistic input. And first, they know exactly which language is which in studies that I think are totally stunning. Um, and second, when you then take those babies and give them a very simple baby attention task where they have to right. learn where Focus to attend. Focus on a toy or something yep. like that. They're, they outperform monolinguals. So all of that, it happens right away, and you don't even need to be able to use the language. You just need to have two sources of input that are setting up two systems that they understand right. are separate for all of this to be put in place. And you were so this was also completely fascinating for me when I, when I knew that such experiments even existed, yeah. that, that people were, were doing these experiments yeah. on six-month-old yeah. kids or, yeah. or, or whatever. But to be very concrete, my understanding is you, the, the strategy that the, the children would be using to, to identify representations of objects would be different if they had this bilingual sensitivity. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, but this is... Uh, this was something that struck me. So I'm a kid that's raised in a bilingual home to the extent that my mother is speaking one language and my father is speaking the other language. So at some level, the, the idea is that I know that the word glass um, uh, pertains to this object, but there might be other things that also pertain to this object. Whereas if I'm somebody who is monolingual, I just assume that that one word pertains to one object. I, I, is, that, is that the strategy? So that's what we used to think. Oh, right. But that's so intellectualizing right. <laughs> it too much okay. because that isn't going to explain what's happening in the six and seven month olds. So that was the story we used to think for kids. Right. You know, like a three year old knows I can call this uh, glass, I right. can call it le verre, right. I can call it all sorts of things. Right. Therefore, there's something about. That's what we used to think with, but this stuff with infants takes it down a notch because infants are not really figuring out word to object mappings. They're just figuring out these two systems. And if you want to really raise the stakes, neonates, we're talking about minutes after birth, who were in utero in a monolingual or bilingual environment. And you could tell a difference show different familiarity responses to the languages they heard in utero. How's that? So how do you, how do, you do this? How, how do you actually set up these, these experiments? What? Yeah, well, infant research is a very special thing, and I don't do it. It's way too hard. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, you have to, in any kind of research that you're doing, um, you have to exploit the responses that your subjects are able to give you. So right. if you're doing research with rats, you're not going to set up a verbal task. You're going to set up something that rats can do, which is you know, learn to run a maze for a food reward. So with infants, you have to set up something that infants can do. And what infants do is show familiarity or not. So if you present a new stimulus, a new sound, a new sight, something to an infant, they'll say, oh, that's really interesting. Oh, not so much. So they habituate very quickly. And this is how we know how infants decide what things are the same. So for example, if you want to know if an infant can see the difference between a circle and a square. So you take an infant and you hook them up to this computer that has um, like a, a pacifier attached. So when infants are excited, they suck furiously. Like, this is really interesting. Right, I right. see this bright red square. I love it, I love it, I love it. And then they get bored. Yeah. And so you keep doing this until the infant is totally bored with what they're seeing. And then you change it. So you change it from a red square to a red circle. If the infant can tell the difference between square and circle, this is a whole new thing. They say, wow, now it's a circle. Oh, oh, oh. And when the sucking increases, you know that they see the difference. If it doesn't, you say, it's, they don't see the difference. Okay. So you exploit what infants do. So that's the, the kind of method used to figure out if these very newborn infants, very young infants, see two 
languages as being first the same or different and second being familiar or not so 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 in practice um, uh, you would this would be verbal stimulation that you would you would give on different languages and see if they would if, if their stimulation rate would increase uh, as you switch the languages or if they wouldn't be able to tell the difference that's, that's exactly right now I, I don't do those experiments right, but, but that is what's in the that, that's the basic paradigm and so you had and, and the study that I'm thinking of was done with infants who were born, were born either to mothers who only ever spoke English and they were in totally English monolingual environments or to mothers who were Filipino and, and, the, and while they were pregnant were in environments where both English and Tagalog were spoken. So these babies are born and you present them with either English or Tagalog or a third language which I think in these studies was Japanese that none of the infants had ever heard. So I'm, I'm just going to interrupt you for a second because I have no idea what Tagalog is. Oh, that's the language, the official language of the Philippines. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs>
to linguistic networks, to cognitive networks, to semantic networks. So the whole brain of the bilingual is wired with more distribution across the hemispheres and front to back. And so it's a more distributed brain network. And crucially, it makes far more use of the frontal systems than would otherwise be found in monolingual brains. And my understanding is this is all very plausible based upon what we know about the frontal lobes and executive control and all the rest of that. But my understanding is you, there's been a wealth of empirical research that's actually been done where you've, you've put people in brain scan and fMRI and all the rest of this. And, and so presumably you've, you've seen real evidence of this. And we even have evidence now, the newest evidence that's coming out now is even more impressive because it's structural, that is brain structure. So there's a couple of labs now, uh, two notably, one in London and one in Milan, that are showing that if you actually measure cortical thickness, you know, how many of those really great gray neurons are there, um, that in those frontal regions, bilinguals have more. So better cortical density in uh, crucial frontal regions for bilinguals. We have published evidence showing better white matter, uh, which is the uh, myelin that covers the neurons that is the communication network. So brain cells communicate um, by signaling each other, and they get covered with this tissue, this white tissue, that kind of speeds up. It's kind of a fiber optic system. It just goes faster if there's this myelin on those networks. So to the extent that that myelin is thick and intact, you get better communication. Right. So we have evidence showing that in older bilinguals, the myelin on the uh, fibers that go from the front of the brain, right around here, it was on the right side actually, to the back, and then across the corpus callosum are more intact in bilinguals. Describe a little bit about what's going on in these experiments. How do you, how do, you do it? What, what sort of questions are you asking? How do you, how do you determine it? Well, the way the technology is set up now, it's really brilliant because you can get everything all at once. So in an ideal experiment now, um, you have a participant in um, an MRI scanner where the MRI has the capability of doing a structural image, which is really what a basic MRI is. It's a basic x-ray of, of these tissues, plus a functional um, coil that will reveal the activation while the individual is actually performing a task, and another coil that measures the integrity of the white matter structure. So you get functional um, information about how, how what's connected to what. You get gray matter structure, so how what's, what's the actual architecture of these brain regions. White matter structure, and now in even more interesting uh, developments, you get information about what the brain is doing functionally at rest when it's not doing anything. And this is really new leading edge stuff. So there are now these networks that people have identified. So when you sit there totally blottoed, you're not thinking about anything, clean your mind, there's still connectivity. Sure. And it turns out that that connectivity is extremely powerful in predicting cognitive ability, cognitive performance. So the rest, the rest level the is rest. really... So the brain at rest tells you a lot about how the brain is organized and what the brain is capable of doing. And there are a couple of these at rest networks that are, that are particularly related to executive control performance, and some that aren't. So what we have now is evidence showing uh, comparing older monolingual and bilingual adults. So these are 72-year-olds, monolingual or bilingual. And we have 
um, images from the, these networks at rest. They're not doing anything. They're, the, the people are told to lie in the scanner, look at this blank screen, and the only instruction is don't fall asleep. And what we see is that on certain kinds of these um, rest networks, like those responsible for memory, those responsible for vision, the groups are exactly the same. But on the two networks that are known to relate to performance in executive control, the bilinguals have better connectivity at rest. So the brain is simply more prepared for these processes. Wow. And, and have you done studies or are you planning on doing studies that um, evaluate the activation of these networks and comparing, contrasting these networks for people who learned languages at different stages along their lives. So uh, the, the person who was born in utero being exposed to, well, I guess you're not born in utero, but anyway, you <laughs> the person who was subjected in utero to, to different languages. You'll explain to this to, me. <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to different languages. Um, all the way up to somebody who's 50 years of age learning a second language for the first time, uh, or, or what have you. And, and, and presumably there would be different, I'm guessing there might be different levels of activation of, of these networks across, again, a spectrum. The research is still too new to know if that's what would happen, but my, my intuition is that that's exactly what it is, because these are all spectrums because these are um, it's essentially training experiences ex the, the effects come through practice and so I would expect that if you would be able to conduct these studies in sufficient numbers with sufficient control I would expect that you would find that there's a relationship between how much bilingual experience the individual had and how these networks were aligned. That would be my expectation. We're a long way from having enough data to know if that's the case. A and I'm wondering also if it might be possible to imagine going the other way. So here's what I mean by that. Um, granted that if I speak two languages, I will have a characteristic uh, network in my brain that's used for various different functions that will have a greater emphasis on this executive function frontal lobe guy than somebody who would be monolingual. Um, might it be possible, granted that language acquisition is something else, but might it be possible that I, I could also take someone, train them using other means to develop this, the executive function, and then say, by that training, that gives me a greater ability to learn a second language. Hmm. So ah. that is to say that, that yeah. you're, you're predisposing those particular networks to exist. That uh, I understand there's no causal link to having those networks exist to learning a language. And that's what I meant about language acquisition. But yeah. it seems at least logically possible that it might somehow make it easier to right, learn a second language. Right, but, but I'm hesitating because some people actually argue that. So there is an argument that it all goes the other way around. Oh, no, it doesn't clearly, it doesn't clearly but, but doesn't. But people argue this, so let's just put it out there. So okay. some people say, well, no, it's that um, executive control allowed this person to become bilingual. So people will say this. Okay. They'll say it's completely the other way around, and what you have is variability in executive control. Those people who have high executive control therefore could learn another language and they became bilingual. So people will argue that. Okay, but that's got to be, sorry, sorry yeah. to interject because I want to yeah. let you get back to it, but that's clearly silly. I okay, mean, thank it's you. Clearly, it's thank you for saying that. But it's clearly, it's clearly silly because you have, a, you have people who, who are just through circumstances bilingual and well you can filter that out. Yeah, but just, you know, here, while we're in the parenthesis here, <laughs> okay, um, people argue that and then go on to say, that, well, we have evidence that executive control is necessary for second language learning, especially in adulthood. And it is, but I would like to just dismiss all of this. I mean, we're having trouble now. We have, a, I think, a fabulous paper that shows this point that's being held up in review because one of the reviewers is insisting 
that you need executive control to learn the language in the first place. And, and this is just totally nuts because the paper is exactly what you're going for. That is, it's a training study. We took monolinguals and we gave half of them a year of Spanish classes and then we looked at their brains. So what could be cleaner, we thought. Right. And this reviewer is kind of making this annoying point. So. But I guess what I'm, what I'm interested in is, is expanding on this notion of plasticity and what you can do with it and whether the arrows can work one way or the other way and building on what you were saying, which is that everything we're doing is affecting the, uh, the neural architecture in yeah. terms of how these systems uh, evolve and, 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 and what, they, what they do and how they exist. And, I'm, and I, I think that can be very liberating for a lot of people because they have the sense that nothing is written in stone and they can consistently develop. And I, and I would be happy to agree with that, you know, if, 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 if the point were clear enough. And, you know, usually I think about it the other way. So I think about bilingualism as being the sort of release of uh, all of this energy that then enables the person to do other things. I don't know. I think it gets a bit messy. Let's talk a little bit about dementia um, because you've done really seminal work I I in this and, and have some, I think, quite astounding uh, results. So uh, rather than me try to summarize what it is, which makes no sense whatsoever, uh, why, don't, why don't I ask you to tell me a little bit about that and, and, and your work with uh, bilingualism and how it, how it may or may not affect dementia? The result is very simple. Um, the result is if you take a large enough sample, and it's got to be a large sample because these are widely varying data, and you just look at the age at which people show symptoms of dementia, just, you know, dad's acting a little off, we better do something. The age at which somebody notices that things are going a little bit odd. On average, again, on average, bilinguals are, bilinguals are significantly older. So we've shown that several times in our sample, but gratifyingly, this has been replicated in many different places around the world. This is four to five years or something, right? I mean, this yeah. is well, oh significantly, yeah. it, it's... It's large. Yeah. But it has to be that large because if it would be less, it wouldn't be significant because the variability is so huge. When we did the first study, the one that was published in 2007, and the results were really striking. It was, in that study, it was four and a half years. I thought, how is this possible? Now, you look at the ranges. In that study, we had about um, 100 monolinguals and 100 bilinguals. The bilinguals were about four and a half years older. But what's astounding is that the range of first evidence of dementia begins in both language groups at 45 years old, and then goes right up into very late in life. So these are huge ranges. So unless this, the mean age is pretty large, has a pretty large difference, you're not going to get a statistical significance because there's so much variability. So that was the first study, but we've replicated it about three times. It's been replicated in California, in India, in Belgium, in lots of places now. So this is a real effect. Someone who has been a lifelong bilingual can mask the effects of the early symptoms of dementia for a significant period of time. Now four or five years, as you point out, is huge, but it's even more important than it would be if we were talking about a disease that can strike at, you know, 30 versus 35. Because dementia is primarily a disease of aging, if you can buy four or five years, it's a game changer. Right. And it has huge implications for public health, family, quality of life. And the argument is, again, neurophysiologically, as I understand it, the argument is that this masking can occur because the dementia affects this executive control 
function in the frontal lobes, and, and therefore they, they, have, they have more experience of being able to use those networks, or what? what uh, well, the puzzle is that dementia, Alzheimer's disease, is initially a memory disorder. It's not a disease of executive control. Mm -hmm. So the puzzle is, how does an experience that boosts the front part of the brain protect against a disease which initially strikes the middle part of the brain? Mm -hmm. So the, the memory uh, disorders that are the first symptoms of Alzheimer's come from the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe, kind of here. How does being bilingual have any impact on that? We were talking about different parts of the brain. So our story is, yet to be confirmed, that because the front part of the brain, this important set of executive processes, are more efficient, more intact, better connectivity, remember, better gray matter density, what we get is compensation. So the front part of the brain is kind of domain general. It's not used just for one thing or another. Right. So having a good front bit of the brain can somehow carry you through as there's deterioration. It comes in as a, as a kind of a reserve. And, and that again, that's not so surprising given the importance, uh, obviously, of that part of the brain combined with plasticity and combined with the fact that the brain can be modified in so many different ways. And, and my understanding is that there are two ways that this manifests itself empirically. Th that is to say, your studies, evidence for, for, for the claims that you're making. The first is some statistical aspect of let's compare uh, the age at which uh, dementia has been uh, diagnosed mm -hmm. for, for these these individuals and then let's look at the let's cross match with the linguistical capabilities as it were of these individuals and but there's another way of, of doing it which is to say uh, let's look at the uh, at people who have the same at the same stage of diagnoses and then compare that to their brains and you find that the people who are actually multilingual have a, have greater uh, Pathological, yeah, That's exactly. Right. Uh, uh, aspects to their to their brains, which implies that exa exactly as you're saying, they're able to mask. This, this, this dementia, and that's, that's, those, that's astounding, because yeah. you're able to get it from both sides. That's right, yeah, so that we have one study that showed that. We have another study uh, where we do not have brain data, but we just have data on their performance levels, and it feeds into the same story. So that's, that's kind of, you know, we would like to be able to do more detailed brain studies to uh, confirm those ideas, but right now that's, the main data we have. So given all of this, and I understand that you're not, um, you're not in the public health field, and you're also not uh, the President of the United States or the Prime Minister Thank of Canada, God for that. And you're, not <laughs> <laughs> you're not in a situation to direct public policy. But if you were in a situation to direct public policy, what sorts of recommendations might you have uh, given your knowledge and given your inclinations as to the, the benefits of multilingualism? I think the benefits of multilingualism for a society, if you're talking about social policy level, go well beyond what I'm talking about. I'm talking about individual advantages. So, you know, if I can be a bilingual individual living in a society, I'll do better personally. But I think that the effects are far greater for societies. I think that the, the greater the openness that societies have to multilingualism, the better the society. Societies that are open to bilingualism are better off for lots of reasons, not just because the individuals might be able to do a Stroop task better. So societies open to bilingualism are more open societies, they're more tolerant societies, they're more culturally diverse societies, they're more engaging societies, they're societies that respect lineage, societies that enable children to communicate with their grandparents who speak a different language and support all of that. So everybody wins if language is accepted as a wide value in society. Some people ask, well, if you have these effects of dementia, then 
at a societal level, is it the case that bilingual societies or bilingual cultures um, should have less Alzheimer's disease than monolingual cultures or societies? And that's absolutely not true. And it's not true for many reasons. First, because bilingualism doesn't prevent Alzheimer's disease, right? And we know that. But second, because you can't compare across societies. Societies have different health systems, different education levels, different social conditions, different socioeconomic configurations. Everything is different. So you can't take the result from an individual and plunk it into a society and say, if only Canada would have better French education so that everybody would be bilingual, we could have some kind of a bulwark against dementia. That's not the implication for societies. I think the implication is more on the level of social values. You know, what we think is important. Why do we think it's important for kids to learn other languages? Why do we think it's important, as we do in Canada, we certainly do in Toronto, for people to be able to speak whatever they like at home, keep their heritage language as the family of the home, have that language respected, by the community so that shops down the street, newspapers, media will provide services in that language as opposed to other countries where that will not happen. You know those countries, I won't name them, where only the official language is respected or accepted. What kind of a world are you creating? This is not about the cognitive implications about of bilingualism. It's about the social implications. Sure. And I think that it connects up if you can then explain that it's also good for people's brains. Right, exactly. And, and, and exactly in the opposite way, pre-1962 when people had this notion that it was bad for your brains, mm -hmm. now you can say, well, it's a good thing for all of these other reasons. And by the way, yeah. it also happens to be very beneficial. Exactly. To, uh, uh, and that's the actually the direction of argument I prefer. I think that the social arguments really are the powerful ones. They're the reasons that people should be paying attention and policymakers should care. Um, and by the way, it's good for your brain. Let me make you an offer. If I were an omniscient being, who could answer any scientific question or any other question that you might have, but let's limit ourselves to science now. Um, what sorts of things would you ask me? I want to know what's keeping you up at night. I want to know what, what you're most puzzled by, what you're most excited by, what you're most curious about on a scientific side. This is hard research to do because it's all messy. And what I try to do in my research is take to use the phrase from Nate Silver, I try to take the signal out of the noise. So you get all kinds of variables and they're all kind of messy and you try very hard to understand what the signal is telling you. And I would like greater closure on this. So we think we know how the brain is being modified by this intense experience, but if we could understand better what's happening online as people learn and use languages and therefore tell us how brains evolve in real time, in a real ecology, we would have a tremendous access to how the brain works. That is, use language as one of the routes to understanding how the brain works because in spite of what some people will tell you, it's still largely a black box. And as much as some people claim we have it figured out, mostly we don't. I think language, because it's our most prevalent experience, it's the most human of our experiences, could be one of those lenses that if we get it right, we may be able to figure out more about how the brain works. So that's one kind of question I wish we had better insight into. The other one is more on the behavioral side and relates to a point you made, you raised a few times. 
bilingualism is messy. And if we could figure out more about what the mess is around the bilingualism in the people we study and the, bi and the mess around the tasks we use, we could understand these effects better. Many people, including us, run experiments. We use people who we think are monolingual and bilingual. We use tasks that we think are getting at the right thing, and we don't get any useful results. It doesn't work. Lots of experiments just don't work. And what's the difference between those and the ones that do work? So that would help us understand more clearly what the interactive conditions are. So both from the brain side and the behavior side, we need to somehow reduce the mess. And I think if we could do that on this one problem, how do bilingual brains work? I think we could get a better understanding in general, overall, about the mind and brain, simply because language might be the most important thing that the brain does. I'm going to ask you to speculate now, and I'm going to take your, these answers that you've just given me. Um, granted that we're at a very preliminary stage, notwithstanding some of the hype that some people may be putting out there, at, at what point in the future do you think we'll start getting a genuinely deeper understanding of these things? We've made remarkable progress in, in all sorts of ways uh, in terms of the technology and the, the associated work which is being done. The, the field of psychology has changed remarkably the, from, from an objective perspective over the past 30 years, um, not only because of this advanced technology, but certainly uh, strongly influenced by this advanced technology. And it's very, very difficult for me as an observer now to draw the line between what is psychology and what is neuroscience and what is cognitive science and all these things are all kind of mixed. For you, you also tilt to the linguistic side of things as well as I'm as I'm guessing you will, <laughs> you will say. So if, if I were to ask you a question of when can we have broadly defined or however you'd like to define it, a genuinely deep understanding of some of these core issues, what would you go out there and say? 50 years, 25 years? Well, I, I years? would not put a number on it, but I'll, I'll give you some sure. perspective on how it's going. So first, as you say, the changes are remarkable and they are exponential, not linear, and, th and that's very key. So once you're on an exponential scale, projections become wilder, because sure. you don't know. I'm thinking about what I used to hear about the projections for when the entire human genome would be mapped. And when it was finally mapped, the astounding thing was it took significantly less time than all the projections because once they got the basic stuff figured out, it was exponential. Sure. And the exponent can change, right? That's exactly. It. And what they ended up with was simpler than what they expected. There were just fewer genes than they were expecting to find. So that was a game changer too. So when, you know, I think when you're projecting about the unknown, you just don't know what, the, what even the factors are. So I wouldn't make any guess in terms of numbers, but I would say that progress is being made at an impressive rate and the insights make sense. So that tells me that it's moving in the right direction. And specifically the future work that you're doing, the, the, the work that you're involved in right now or thinking about over the next, next couple of years? What I'd love to do more now in the immediate future is look at the brain underpinnings of the dementia results that we've had. I would love to be able to figure out what's different right. between the brains of monolingual and bilingual patients with dementia, because then you can project backwards and understand how they got there in a much clearer way. And this gets back to what you said before about how is it possible that the executive control functions in the frontal lobe can affect the hippocampus and other areas around here. Exactly. Well, this was wonderful. Thank you very Thank much. You. It Thank was you. a pleasure. It was Thank a pleasure, Ellen. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.